scaling artificial intelligence for the enterprise, helping AI work its magic. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Sri Ram Raghavan, Vice President, IBM Research AI. Welcome, Sri Ram. Hi, Tanya. Good to meet you. Good to meet you as well. Tell us about the mission of IBM Research AI and give us a brief summary of your journey through the AI world. Excellent. So um, IBM Research is a global research organization. We have labs in 13 countries, 19 locations. And, and my role as the vice president for IBM Research AI is to drive our work in AI research across our global footprint of labs. That means that you know, we look at the forefront of AI, the innovations in AI, the latest advances in AI, and drive an integrated agenda across all our labs where we advance the frontiers of AI and then deliver those advances through our commercial offerings in IBM to our clients and customers across the globe. Artificial intelligence has proven useful in a number of specific tasks around the enterprise. So mm -hmm. where are we in moving from narrowly applied use cases to maybe yeah. more broad or complex human-like tasks? So we are in the middle of that journey, Tanya. We're right in smack in the middle of that journey from narrow to broad. So let's step back a little bit and think about why we're all, including me and you and everybody excited about AI. What we have seen is the promise of narrow AI, which is that if I have a task that's sufficiently well-defined and narrowly scoped, and I have large volumes of data, right? The task could be face recognition, could be translation of languages, could be you know, spotting football stars in a basketball game, you know, pick your favorite use of AI. We know how to do that really, really well, given large amounts of data, narrowly focused tasks. And sometimes we can do it even better than humans. That's sort of why we're also excited about it. But to scale AI in the enterprise, for, to have it work magic across every sector, every industry, every profession, every line of business, it's going to require us to build AI that has a few different characteristics from narrow AI. So let's think about what those characteristics are. A, AI needs to be less data hungry. Like it doesn't take humans a lot of data to learn new things. So we got to build AI that's a little less data hungry, can still be smart with smaller amounts of data. We need to build AI that's robust and explainable because I can't deploy AI in mission critical applications if I don't quite know what it will do. So I need to be able to manage it, control it, describe it, build it. So trustworthy AI that's robust and explainable. And then I need to build AI that I can manage the life cycle of. In other words, remember that we tend to simplify and say, here is a problem, let's go use the latest. I'm gonna use logistic regression, I'm gonna use deep neural networks, I'm gonna build an AI model. And we act as if it's done. No, it's not done because you're gonna to have to manage it, deploy it, monitor it, figure out if it's still doing well as it, you know, data changes, your use case changes. So we got to build AI that's manageable and you can trust and use it over the course of its life cycle. And that is the journey from narrow to broad. That's exciting a lot of us as technologists. So, so let's talk about the data set. How do you build a data set that can support broader, more complex tasks? Yeah. So, um, it's interesting that you asked about data set because what we see in the enterprise is that the challenge in scaling AI in the enterprise really begins with a challenge around scaling data. So what does that mean? That means I'm as a data scientist, I have the best tools on the planet, but where do I go find the right data set to build my best model? What if I only have a little bit of the data set? What if the data set is not clean? What if it doesn't have the insight that I need? So what's happening in the enterprise is interestingly, this emerging theme that we are very excited about that we call AI for AI. So what does that mean? It means how do I use AI to make the task of building and deploying AI better? It's like AI helping itself. So put your, uh, yourself in the shoes of a data scientist, right? You are, um, you are in a bank. Um, you're being asked to build this fantastic AI model that's going to improve my profitability by 3x. And you're ready to go, ready to go do it. But then you run into this issue that, okay, I have to go find the data, I have to clean it, I have to curate it. There's like 300 different model types I could do. Which model do I do? I have to retrain it. What if AI could help you in that journey? So that rather than you taking three, six months to go from a problem to actually delivering something, you could bring it down to a few weeks to a day. That would be magical. And that's sort of the journey that we are in. We're in the journey of not just evolving AI to be broad, 
but using AI to simplify the task of building AI. So it's sort of AI for AI. That's a very interesting emerging theme that we are excited about. And as just one example of you know, what we have done in research as part of our offering, we took that idea and, and released a capability called Auto AI, which is part of our commercial offering that takes a slice of that journey of a data scientist and automates it. So it doesn't mean you don't do your work, but the engine does a lot of the things for you, gives you back a, a, a saying, here is the best model or a few of the best models I have found. You examine it, fine tune it, you decide which one's good, go deploy it. But all this munge work that you had to do before, I'm going to speed it up. What role does natural language processing play in helping AI become more general purpose tool as well? So it's interesting you talk about natural language processing because for us, the clients and enterprises that we see, look, text is the language of business. Many, many business processes in, the, in an enterprise are driven by natural language processing. That could be emails, it could be conversations, it could be collaboration channels, could be you know, documents, et cetera, et cetera. And being able to get value out of natural language processing is fundamental to, to the promise of AI in the enterprise. And we are very excited about where we are in the journey because I think natural language is an area where we see the evolution of a new type of AI, AI that we call neurosymbolic AI. So let's, let's ask what that means. It's a place where we are bringing together two different approaches that have, people have used in the past to do AI. The approach that's been data driven, right? We talked about data hungry AI. That's the neural approach. Don't tell me anything, just give me a lot of data, I'll learn interesting things from it. Then the other type of AI is, let's set down what we want to do. Let's write out the rules of the game. Let's represent knowledge, reason about knowledge, right? Sort of the symbolic word. And we believe that to really make fundamental advances in language, you got to bring the two together. So that's this area of neurosymbolic AI that we are very excited about. We're doing a lot of work ourselves with our academic partners in building systems that combine data driven with symbolic approaches that allow us to really break the barrier of language. And we are really early in the journey, right? You, you know, at IBM, we have always been passionate about understanding language, whether it was our work with Jeopardy in the past, with the recent work with Debater. And these are examples where we've really pushed the ability of the machine to understand the nuances of language. How do we understand idioms? How do we understand complex statements? And I think we're very excited about pushing that boundary to neurosymbolic and really coming up with breakthroughs that, that drive impact. So as AI begins helping humans with bigger decisions and problem solving, how do we ensure that the decision-making algorithms are trustworthy? Yes, excellent question. And, and that's an important axis of the journey from narrow to broad. And we think of uh, AI models being trustworthy in four pillars. So the first one is fairness. How do you make sure that, or you know, removal of bias? How do you make sure that the AI models do not make discriminatory judgments on attributes on which you do not want to discriminate. Sometimes these are attributes like you know, race, sex, gender, and so on. Sometimes these are other attributes as a business you do not want to judge one way or the other. How do you control that? Because if I just give a, uh, an AI model a bunch of data, it's going to learn whatever the data says. So how do you account and manage for it? So that's one element of trustworthy. And we've been working to build toolkits and techniques, and we have done that in the open. To, to enable people to look at biases in data, mitigate bias in data, test models for bias, correct models for bias. And that's a very exciting area of research for us. A second example of trustworthiness is knowing where the model came from, the lineage. How do I keep track of what data was used? When was it last updated? How was it acquired? A third element of trust, uh, a trustworthy AI is explainability. You're never going to trust a decision maker. If you ask me for an opinion, and I gave you an opinion, you will want to know why. Like explain why you said what you did. How do we get AI to explain itself? That's a very interesting problem because a lot of the AI we build today with narrow AI isn't on its own explainable. So building AI systems that can explain their decision is an interesting challenge. So you put this all together, you, you get to build AI models that are explainable, can check themselves for bias and correct themselves and can you know, speak to where they were born from. Like, where did I come from? And they can talk through the lineage. IBM offers cloud and desktop tools to help organizations simplify and scale data science to optimize results. Tell mm -hmm. us about um, IBM Watson Studio and maybe some related resources. 
Yes. So we talked earlier about automation of AI and, and you know bringing down the work of the data scientists. So the auto AI capability is actually something that was an innovation from research that we recently released in the Watson Studio toolkit that actually provides that capability. And, and if you use Watson Studio today, you'll be able to use the auto AI capability to add a click of a button, automatically train a model, look at possible models, and then you know, decide which ones you want to deploy. And that's just, you know, it's the starting point. We're looking to expand automation both on the data side, help you with data preparation and curation, and also expand on the deployment side. It's not just about helping you build the model, downstream can I automate the deployment and monitoring of the model. So, so that's, that's a place where I would you know, encourage some of your viewers to go take a look and they'll be fascinated by that technology actually. So what's the cost then to experiment with these tools? So we make, by the way, our overall philosophy with AI has been this whole uh, state, you know, mantra around what's in anywhere, which is we make our AI systems available wherever your data is. So you can go to our public cloud, you know, put your data and use it. We also make our AI tools available on-prem wherever you're able to deploy our commercial offerings. Because we know that in many enterprise situations, it isn't easy to move the data where your tools are. So we believe we got to make the tools available where the data is and use it in a very flexible environment. Shri Ram Raghavan, Vice President, IBM Research AI. If someone wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out more about these tools, how can they do that? So they can reach me on LinkedIn. They can just Google for me on LinkedIn. I'm available on LinkedIn. And my Twitter handle is Sriram Raj, S-R-I-R-A-M-R-A-G-H. And I'm happy to, to, to chat with people. Thanks again, Sriram. And if you guys want to find me and more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.